Good morning, everyone, and welcome to South Church, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We're very glad that you could join us this morning. I'm the Reverend Susan Sahusky brown the interim minister here. We're glad you could join us for worship services. To friends and members, we know that there is a lot going right on now in and within the congregation. And most importantly, though, rather than talking about any of that today, we want to be together for worship. This is a... Um, tense time with COVID. It's a tense time with all that's happening in our lives, and it's important that we gather together for worship. I am always pleased to have with me the worship associates and other persons who make the worship possible. So this morning, I'm going to introduce you to our worship associate, Jonathan Cummins, and he is going to uh, introduce you to the rest of the persons who make this worship possible. Blessings upon you all. Peace be with you. Jonathan? Good morning. My name is Jonathan Cummings. I'm one of a team of worship associates that assist with creating and writing services for South Church. And I also want to welcome our music director today, Joanne Connolly. Good morning. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm very happy to be here on this beautiful fall morning with both of you to lead this service. This morning, Susan Adams and I will provide music around the democratic process mm -hmm. and that great freedom that we have in that, and also around our theme of deep listening. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Joanne. Our time for all ages today will be delivered by Jen Del Deo. And special thanks to Pip Clues again for editing our service and thereby enabling our virtual congregating. And we'll also be hearing from Robin Schnell today. And thank you for sharing your Sunday morning with us. We invite everyone, first-time viewer or a long-time member, to join us for a virtual social hour immediately after service. You can ask any questions you may have, reflect on the service, or just chat with a newer old friend. Welcome. Hello. Happy Sunday, everyone. My name is Emily bolton Lusenhop, and I'm a member of the Fellowship Associates. I'm here today to invite you to our new membership class, which will be held virtually on November 1st, 8th, and 15th. We already have quite a few people signed up, and we're interested in having anyone else who wants to join. Please email us at fellowship at southchurch-uu.org for more information or to sign up. We look forward to hearing from you. Have a great day. Our annual holiday silent auction is going to happen with a new kind of silent, online. The auction is dependent on your donations, such as art, gift certificates to local restaurants, garden centers, theaters, and vacation homes, etc. Generosity and volunteers are needed to make this another successful South Church event. Contact Judy Colavecchio at judc0209 at comcast.net. The South Church Spiritual Book Group is hosting a discussion of Beloved by Toni Morrison on Wednesday, October 14th at 7 p.m. by Zoom. All are welcome. Please contact South Church Book Group at gmail.com for the Zoom link and more information. On Thursday, October 29th at 6 p.m., Vespers will host Altars of Remembrance, a virtual Vespers service to celebrate the lives of those who have gone before us. Watch the upcoming newsletter and Sunday announcements for info, or contact Ann Demenov at the underscore dem at comcast.net. Living Room Lectures present Alec Gerwitz, October 4th, 7 p.m. This Fulbright Scholar will share life lessons from his work with people with intellectual disabilities.
Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listening. Did you hear the silence? Did it linger long enough for you to start to reflect? Perhaps that is the difference between listening and deep listening. Listening to others in silence. Deeply listening. Audible silence both of your voice and of your mind. This is hard right now. Our communities, despite our physical separation, feel to me like they are moving fast, racing forward, perhaps even leaving me behind. Our day-to-day -day decisions to stay or go, to engage or withdraw, seem to carry more weight, both for our personal safety and for their impact on the health and safety of our community and our nation at large. Having a quiet mind right now is a challenge. Giving active, deep listening to other voices, even more so. Perhaps that is what we need though. I guess I'm prone to the emotion that campaign slogans can capture, despite my aversion to branding because the Build Back Better slogan has captivated me. It is giving me hope in a future that I can imagine. It feels tangible and achievable and 
just around the corner. I try to use this image as my capstone for a quiet mind, a mind that is better able to listen deeply. There's so much vitriol in our political community. It is hard for me to engage and to function in that community right now, despite how important it feels to me. But I try to use my keystone to listen to that vitriol and to hear its cause. It's hard to feel like you always have to be the one to take the better, wiser path. However, someone must if that path is to be tread. Perhaps the easiest way to take the first step is not with physical action, but with a mental one. Making a clear choice to hear deeply the views of our nation. Now, there are views and policies being expressed that are unforgivable, that cross thresholds that should not be crossed. But if I listen well, listen deeply, sometimes I hear things I can empathize with. Something from which I hope and I believe we all can together both build back better and make America greater. I offer two brief poems as we light our chalices today. First, Why Are We Here? by Eric Walker Winstrom. May we listen so that we can hear. May we hear so that we can feel. Second, from the Soul Matters team, The Echo of Inner Wisdom. We light this chalice to remember the light within, to know that the hunger we feel inside is not an emptiness, but the echo of an inner wisdom that already knows what we need. May our time together help us welcome that voice and each other back home. Please join me in reciting our mission statement. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people, and we inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. Good morning, everyone. I'm really so happy to be here with you. And this morning, we're starting a new month. It's October, October 4th already. And because we're starting a new month, we also are starting to explore a new church theme this Sunday. Yeah, this month's theme is deep listening. So I ordered something that goes with this theme and the package just arrived. So right here, I have an ear. Yep, ear. So most of us have two ears like one on each side of our head. Kirsten, you're making kind of a confused face. What's going on? What's that? Um, that's not an ear, Jen. It's not an ear. Box. Box says ear. E-A-R. The order said it was an ear. Fits on my head. Must be an ear. Mm -mm. Isn't this an ear? Mm -mm. Nope. That's a heart. Oh, wait a minute. That's not an ear, that is a heart. Well, what would a heart have to do with deep listening? Kirsten, what do you think? Hmm. Well, when you listen with your heart, you can find out how people feel. Part of deep listening is listening with our hearts to hear another person truly and fully. It's one way to show compassion. I think it means paying attention when a person is trying to tell you something, so you try and tune in with your whole body. Maybe that's why they sent you a heart. Uh, sorry, what did you say? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Well, I, I was talking about deep listening and how um, maybe the reason they sent you a heart is because listening with our heart means really paying attention when a person's trying to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Listening with your heart means really paying attention when a person's trying to, trying to tell you something. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was, right. saying, I, was say, I was saying listening with your heart means really paying attention when a person's trying to tell you something. I give up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Were you, are you saying that listening with your heart means really paying attention when a person is trying to tell you something? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. I knew that. I always do that. Jenny, I think maybe you might need to practice a little bit more. <laughs> yes. In all seriousness, it takes practice to listen to our, our hearts or with our hearts. And it involves paying attention to people. And that feels really important right now. Yeah. Sometimes listening with your heart is choosing not to do things, other things, when someone is talking to you. Sometimes it means letting someone express that they're upset and maybe not responding right away, especially if you feel yourself getting upset in response, because it can be really hard to hear each other when we're upset. Yeah. Sometimes there are things we think we don't even want to hear. But being in relationship together, it means loving each other enough to really listen with our hearts and our full attention, even if it's something we don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. We really are here to help you practice listening. Yeah. And we're here ready to listen for real. It's not always easy. Mm -hmm. We're here to listen to you. Mm -hmm. We love you. We're listening and we're listening. Hope to be together soon. Good morning. I'm Tom Barry, a member of this year's annual budget campaign. This is the group that's responsible for raising the funds that will go towards our 2021 operating expenses. I'm honored to have this time this morning with you to share why South Church and donating to South Church are really important to me. I started to come to South Church in the summer of 2014 I had just received a pretty significant medical diagnosis that would require major, uh, major surgery. I was nervous. I was scared. I knew I could kind of lean on my patience and resolve and tenacity to get through the hardest parts, but I really needed community. In South Church, I found that community. I found it in Reverend Chris, who helped me and reached out and invited me to the Journey to Membership class. I became a member in the fall of 2015. I found it in Kevin Leahy, who taught me everything I needed to know about hosting Social Hour, that time after service where we make new connections, deepen existing ones, and learn more about all the wonderful things that happen here. I found it in our wonderful religious education staff, who readily welcomed my niece and nephew into their thoughtful programming and who encouraged me last year to become a, me a mentor in the Coming of Age program. Hey, Liam. I found it in small group ministry, sharing deeply and making connections that have lasted over the years. I found it in the winter retreat at Ferry Beach, where I shared long walks on the beach and in the forest. Uninterrupted discussion and deep listening really led to the establishment of some really solid friendships. I found it at a BLM protest downtown where we engage with local community members to have them write pledge flags of what they would individually commit to doing to become more anti-racist. Those flags then hung along our iron fence out front. I found it again in 2018 when I needed another major surgery, this time supported by the warm embrace of our pastoral associates, led by wonderful Alice O'Trainer and the many families who supported my family during that hard time offering meals. I could go on and on. Christmas Eve services, water in gathering, community service, youth-led services, holiday potlucks and auctions, our wonderful music program, summer retreats on Star Island. Next time you see me in person, ask me why I like the portico so much. You see, South Church provided me with community when I needed it most and has continued over the years to be one of my most important communities. The way we have rallied as a community showing resolve,
patience, tenacity, to keep this loving community moving forward and thriving has truly been awe-inspiring. We have a community goal this year of $515,000. That's a significant increase from previous year's efforts. I know this has been a trying year for many. In these times, I ask you to consider what the presence of South Church in your life means to you. Our South Church community will endure through this time thanks to our shared generosity. Thank you so much. Today's offering, as indicated in the video, can be given via the South Church website. Our offering this month is being shared with Seacoast Outright. Seacoast Outright is celebrating its 27th year supporting lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth and their allies in the Seacoast area and beyond. Please give as you are able. Hi, I'm Hershey Hirschkopf, the executive director of Seacoast Outright, coming to you from beautiful Hillsborough, New Hampshire. And I wanted to say thank you so much for your ongoing support of our organization. Um, as many of you know, we spent the past 27 years supporting LGBTQ youth in the Seacoast area via um, weekly support groups, events, um, our annual Pride Week uh, rally, march, marketplace, um, as well as being part of the Youth Suicide Prevention Network and offering case management resources, referrals, um, and doing outreach and training to the greater community. Um, of course, in this time of the global pandemic, we have pivoted to weekly Pictionary Zoom games. Um, we've added a chat space and soon we'll be offering one to two individual 15 minute check-ins for our kids by appointment to better support them at this time. Um, our other update is that we have finished strategic planning and part of that will be prioritizing a new space. So send tips to me if you have buildings or spaces that could use a tenant improvement and we could move into soon. Uh, and also with that expanding services to include um, more in-depth mental health programming. Uh, so that's my update. Thank you very much once again. Uh, be well, wash your hands, be safe. Thanks.
I invite you into a time of some prayerful reflection, meditation, and quiet time. Holy one of blessing, this season of turning and changing, of leaves falling, of bright colors, reminds us that life is transient, ever-changing, and that we are just a part of the nature, the nature of all that is, that means change is inevitable, transformation is possible, and that beautiful, beautiful colors and odors and noises and experiences arise out of that changing. The gentle falling of leaves, the piles of leaves that I remember raking up as a child and building tunnels and playing with the smell, the smell of the leaves and the smell of autumn, all a reminder that life turns, life changes, and we, we are just a part of it. We know that this is a tough time for many people. There are many in our congregation who are ill, who've lost loved ones, who are battling issues that are facing them. And we also know that we are never alone, that here at South Church, we hold you, we hold you in love and compassion and care. Whether you have expressed your concerns or not, know that we are here for you. And during the next few moments of silence, I'm going to write you, invite you to write your prayer concerns in the chat line below. Write to us, even if this isn't the way that you want to express your needs and you want to call or you want to send an email, please do so. It's important that you know that we're here for you and we care and we will walk with you during all times of transformation, no matter what is going on in your life. Share your concerns with us. Blessed be. May blessings be heaped upon you. Amen. It matters that you vote. Sometimes when presidential candidates are out politicking in swing states, I have heard them refer to this as trying to root out the voters from under their rocks. 
but a most unpleasant, horrible image out from under the rocks, not able to be seen, heard, or thought of until they crawl out, slithering out like a snake with all the negative connotations that are drawn when we allude to hiding reptiles is most troubling. Voters don't need to be under rocks. They don't need to hide the fact that they are voting, nor even whom they are voting for, should they choose to share that. Voting is a proud and honorable right and civic duty. It is a responsibility, an obligation that one engages in because it is the right thing to do. It is an honor to vote in a democratic society. Uh, democracy as a process permits a group to follow its collective conscience. And at the same time, democracy is messy and fraught with all possibilities of conflict. These past few months, we have mourned the death of important advocates for voting and democracy and those who demonstrated the responsibility and commitment that voting requires. And of course, we think of John Lewis, who wrote in the New York Times essay, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. And I too want to mention longtime politician and civil rights activist and US House representative from Maryland's seventh district and also a leader of the Black Caucus, Elijah Cummins, who died October 2019. Among other ways of exercising the democratic process, he was a leading figure in the impeachment hearings against Donald Trump. His impassioned yet reasoned attention to fair process impressed me as an example of how to practice democracy with conscience and respect for difference. For one of our Unitarian Universalist principles is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. And of course, we must remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice and advocate for all. Each of these persons in their own way and especially by the lives they lived, the passions they acted on and the process they followed put them in and the way they put into practice how to use the democratic process through the lens of conscience while all the time respecting differences. This has presented one of the biggest challenges to me these past years. I really do desire deep dialogue with people who have different political, social, cultural perspectives from mine. And I find it increasingly harder to find a middle road to meet upon to discuss those deeply meaningful issues of ethical, religious, cultural, social differences. Far too quickly an impasse occurs and a deep divide leads to not finding a commonality to explore a free and responsible search for truth and meaning using compassion and equity in human relations, but instead chasms too deep to cross. And at the same time, it is people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Elijah Cummins, and John Lewis who did find pathways to connect others. And if my voting provides a way to get people together to have deeper conversations, then I must not hesitate to vote. I must not lose hope. And it is hard. I hearken back to the words of Cornell West in his 2004 book, Democracy Matters. He writes, the basis of democratic leadership is ordinary citizens' desires to take their country back from the hands of corrupted plurocratic and imperial elites. West goes on to talk about how this desire was built upon an awakening from among unrepresented people. This awakening and struggle has happened three major times in our democratic society, or three major times that I want to outline today. The first was in 1870 when the right to vote was given regardless of race. However, 
However, the hurdles that existed to thwart this right were not overcome until the 1960s during the civil rights era. And unfortunately, we are witnessing a swing back to thwarting the rights to hope. Currently, there is a bill sitting in the Senate Judiciary Committee titled the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And this act as reported by an August Christian Century Magazine article introduces new mechanisms for the enforcement of voting rights which aim to target practices that have had a history of leading to racial discrimination and made voting more difficult again for disenfranchised minority voters. The second major struggle was to give the right to vote to women in the 1920s. And the third was in 1971 when the age to vote was lowered to age 18. I remember the noise about this and a lot of it negative. Yet I know that this right has given new political energy to lots of campaigns. Both of my children voted as soon as they were of age. Scott, my oldest, stays continually active in voting and in politics. And my younger, Eric, is discouraged and feels that his vote doesn't count. I find that sad. His discouragement reminds me that democracy is an imperfect and messy act and that voting is how we express our desires and that conversations, engagement, and activism is how we support those desires. These democratic awakenings and the political, social, and cultural activity and energy surrounding these struggles show us that the right to vote is not to be taken lightly. People have struggled since the founding of this nation to obtain and keep the right to vote because we believe it is a right and it is good and it has value. And I think of my son, Eric, and I ask, well, why don't people vote? Some say, I don't have time. I don't know who to vote for. It won't count. It doesn't matter. No one's going to listen to me anyways. Well, following the issue of gay marriage, I learned a valuable lesson. I used to think that politicians didn't listen either, but I found out that they do, and they do want to know what their voters think. When the right to marriage was happening in Massachusetts, I arranged and held a meeting between a state senator who was avowedly and outspokenly against gay marriage and a group of about 12 GLBT folk who shared their stories and their struggles. She changed her mind and her vote because of this interaction, because she cared what her voters and what people thought. So if I don't vote or express my opinions, even to the politician I don't vote for, then I am giving up too much personal power. And West writes, to many, our democratic system seems so broken that they have simply lost faith that their participation could really matter. The politics of self-interest and catering to narrow special interest is so dominant that many ask themselves, why vote? This disaffection, he continues, stems both from the all too true reality, the corruption of our system, and from a deeper psychic disillusionment and disappointment. However, he goes on to remind us that the focus groups and poll-driven advertisements and the non-substantial slogans, the lack of authenticity of the candidates and disgust that we feel about the entire systems stems from our deep desire to hear more authentic expressions about our lived reality. Now think about that. I think he's saying that we want our politicians to speak and address the pain of our individual lives and to be about the common good. Yes, we are disillusioned and we want to see authentic integrity. We want people that we vote for 
to care about the common good. And so as conscientious citizens, what can we do? Charlie Clements, who is a former CEO of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, once stated, voting is where democracy begins. Human rights must have a strong, effective voice if they are going to have any meaning. And former UU President Bill Sinkford wrote, ours is a faith with a spiritual center and a civic circumference. I like that. So if voting is the beginning of the democratic process, what are engaged citizens to do? Vote. So what if the candidate you supported doesn't win? You can still influence our society through engagement in the democratic process. And let's be clear, this work will not end on November 3rd. It will and it must continue even then. The democratic tradition did not begin in America, but it has taken its roots here. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that to be human is to be responsible and to be part of civilization in order to contribute to the good cause. And to do this, we must explore and question personal and socially conceived dogmas, teachings, and beliefs. Emerson spoke against pursuing narrow self-interest or seeking vast material interest and warned of lesser morals, selfishness, deceit, and a lack of integrity that took advantage of others. That's what he's talking about. For at its best and in essence, democracy should provide for the needs of all, should respect, listen, and assist all citizens to deal with the pains of daily living, and it should address the evils of oppressive structures. And when it fails, and we have seen that, congregations and groups of like-minded folk can and must join together to do the work and help those people, those who have experienced the harm that the corrupt and inefficient politicians have afflicted upon them. Democracy can teach us to make a difference and to be effective and responsible contributors to the world. Voting is the most important act to engage in to be part of the democratic society. It matters that you vote. Please do so. This morning I asked uh, Robin Schnell to share with us a little bit about what motivates her to spend so much time, energy, resources in making sure that votes get heard. I was touched when talking with Robin to hear her story, and it reminded me of mine, and I asked her if she'd be kind enough to share it with you. And I'll now ask Robin to take some moments to tell us about why voting matters. May it be so. The story I'm about to tell is one of addiction. My name is Robin, and I'm a politics junkie. Like other addictions, it involves my money, my time, and my energy. My earliest memory about voting was when I walked down to the neighborhood polling place with my mother and held onto her skirt as she went into the voting booth to vote. She would not let me stand in there with her because everyone's vote is secret, she told me. Does Daddy know who you vote for? I asked. No, not even Daddy. Secret votes aside, elections were a worthy dinner table conversation at our house. My parents were diehard Republicans, and we had the bumper stickers to prove it. A-U-H-2-O. Goldwater. Needless to say, when I reached voting age, I was well primed to vote. I was not, however, terribly interested in politics between elections. I read the papers when the articles comparing candidates came out, made my decisions, and pulled the lever, almost always for Democrats. 
I didn't vote for school board members until I had children. It was not until 2009 when I attended the criminal trial of a refugee friend and got involved with criminal justice activists that it truly hit me that who was elected all up and down the ballot, including judges, was of critical importance in all aspects of our lives. The human web of life all of a sudden came into much clearer focus. I started writing letters to the editor because I realized that there were terrible things happening that others were not seeing. I started lobbying at the state level for criminal justice reform uh, and other reforms with the Interfaith Power and Light. I joined the Social Justice Associates at our UU Society in Schenectady. I started going to city council meetings over the issue of sanctuary cities and joined the Poor People's Campaign. After collecting signatures in an attempt to get a black man on the ballot for Schenectady City Council, I was shocked to find out that the local democratic political machine was not very welcome, welcoming to a black working class man. They found ways to not allow signatures, even the man's wife. These were Democrats, my people. Voter suppression is not a one party issue. I started donating directly to candidates. By the time the Mueller report started, I had hit the depths of my addiction. I contributed to Politico and read along with them. It's not just the people that you vote for, but all of their political appointees and political careerists who are worthy of our attention. It's likely a good thing that everybody hasn't waded into the swamp as far as I have. Thanks to my husband and his insistence that we step away from the screen or at least watch a movie, I've achieved some balance in my life when I don't think about politics. But this year, more than any other year in U.S. history, the fate of our country pivots on who gets elected all up and down the ballot. I'm not telling you how to vote. But for the sake of the air you breathe, the food you eat, the level of the sea, the global migration of humans and animals, war and peace, I beg you, vote. Tell your elected officials what you care about and that you care what they do. Do it in person or vote absentee. Either way, your vote will get counted. The Social Justice Associates recently sent out a request for folks to address postcards. Your response was rapid and huge. In two days, we had sent out 500 postcards. Thank you. The email you received had other actions you can take. Nothing relieves anxiety like action, so keep up the good work. Your democracy depends on it. This morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Walking and talking with my mind Stayed on freedom, walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on freedom, walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on freedom, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Singing and praying with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Woke up this morning with my mind
stayed on freedom Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our time of worship is drawing to an end. I always am reminded that a benediction is uh, not just goodbye, but a benediction is a reminder of who we are and how we should be in the world. It's a time of blessing. And we know that as Unitarian Universalists, it is our responsibility to send blessings out into the world. We are facing many challenges these days. And we know that because we have the blessing, the love, the care of one another, that peace will prevail. Love is the answer. Peace is our goal. May you go forth full of love, and hope and peace be with you and all those whom you love and we pray for. So may it be. Here are some ways that you can give to South Church. To make your 2021 pledge, fill out and mail your financial commitment form to South Church at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth, or send an email to the Annual Budget Committee Chair, Lori Bilby, at turningtide at comcast.net. To pay your pledge or to make donations, go to the South Church website southchurch-uu.org, click on the donate button on the top and follow the prompts. You can also mail us a check to South Church at 73 Court Street in Portsmouth, noting the type of gift that you are making. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out at 603-436-4762 or by emailing info at southchurch.org. Dash uu.org.